It's a real privilege to bring the Word of God to you this evening, and uh, we are in the middle of the Whatever Happens series on a Wednesday night, and on a Sunday, we've got the flip the script, so the two just coincides beautifully as we go on this amazing journey that God is taking our church on as we did our Vision Sunday. Many of you would have seen the Reach for Raise Up and Release Wide, and that's what it's all about, the flip the script. And this evening, I've got the privilege of reading from Philippians 3. Verse 1 to 12, and I just want to give a little bit of background. Again, we haven't been going through the book of Philippians for a while now, so I'll just recap. Paul is in jail, and the, the church in Philippi is, uh, is a, 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 a lovely church, a beautiful church. In fact, he loves the church because it's a church that is generous towards him, and they send Epaphroditus to him, giving him gifts, which is absolutely amazing. So Paul loves this church. It's one of his babies. You could call it that, one of his babies in terms of starting the church in Philippi. And uh, he, he writes back to the church of Philippi saying, thank you, but the, this letter is purely based on rejoicing and having joy. And I, I really want to just bring our attention to the fact of where Paul is when he says this. He's in jail. He's in captivity. He's chained. And this is a man that says rejoice. And so I, when I think of that and rejoicing, and I'm thinking, if I had to be in jail, would I be doing the same thing? Would I be doing this? Would I be rejoicing when I'm in jail? Would I be writing to Life Changes Church and say, hey, thank you guys. Just keep on rejoicing in what you're doing. I, I, I seriously doubt that. I seriously doubt that. However, there's something special about this man when he writes this letter. And I really don't want to just minimize what Paul is doing here. He's encouraging people, locked down, in darkness, praising God, yet encouraging others. And so I really want to bring our attention to that, that this man, as he writes this letter, he's doing something spectacular. He's actually fighting. He's fighting for us to find joy in what Christ Jesus already achieved for us, what he's already done for us. And he's sitting with this joy inside of him, writing out of captivity, confinement, and saying, rejoice. Rejoice always, and he mentions this in this letter throughout. And so I'm going to take it up from there because this is important to understand. Philippians 3 verse 1 to 12, if ever you had a vision for your life, is to get to know Christ Jesus more. And so this evening, we want to glorify Christ and uh, horrify the devil and edify the saints. That's what we want to do this evening. Come on, are you ready to fight this evening? We are ready to fight. So lift and roll back your sleeves and get ready. For this is what it's about. And I know each one of us, we're always fighting for something. There's always something fighting for our attention. And we're always fighting against something. And that's intrinsically who we are. The way we fight, however, determines who we are. And that's important to understand as well. And so I've got a beautiful family. And Gabe would have introduced them, little Zach and Lee and my wife. And they are fighting for my attention right now. They are fighting for me to be in their presence. They are fighting to spend some time with me. Lee is in matric at the moment, and it's an absolute yeah. miracle. Wow. And I say that because I know where Lee has come from, and I can see where he's going, and God is faithful. And so Lee is uh, uh, in matric, and we're watching out. We have to look and watch and see that he follows that path. And so there's attention that needs to be given in that area. Little Zachary is a... <laughs> three years old, turning four, and some of you might know him, but he's an energetic little boy, and he also demands Dada's attention very much. And then there's my marriage that always, and always, and I say above everything else, always uh, requires attention from my side. So we're always fighting to have some kind of uh, attention, well, at least giving attention to something, and that is important to understand. But there are always other things fighting for our attention which is important as well, like social media. Yeah. Always fighting a little Twitter coming up and a Facebook coming up. Well, stay on Facebook, please don't. <laughs> I'm just asking you, stay on Facebook. But these are the things creeping in to our day, and it sort of takes our attention away from what matters most. And I want to encourage us this evening that there are things that we need to fight for that are solid. It's like going to the doctor and the doc you, you, the, you tell the doctor that you've got a headache, and the doctor says, right, well, let me give you a painkiller which is the right prescription. However, that's the symptom. The cause is you're sitting in TV for seven hours. You're sitting in front of the TV for seven hours. Mm -hmm. This evening, we want to fight the cause. And we are not going to treat symptoms tonight. We're not going to treat why things are not working out. We're not going to treat why you're not getting the job. Tonight, we're treating the cause as to what we need to fight for. And we're going to dig deep this evening. Number one, we have to fight and crucify the flesh. 
And I want to read from verse 1 to 3, and it's, Paul writes this, and he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And when he says it's not tedious, it's almost like he can repeat himself in saying this over and over. It's not tedious because it's important for you to understand. He says, Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Tonight we're going to fight and crucify the flesh. Because that's what this is all about. And the Judaizers, let me just explain a little bit about the Judaizers who are in the church. They believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's always this something that needs to be added. You know, they've, they've got this treasure chest of what they were great at back in the day, and that's the law. They were Pharisees, and so they understood the law, and they were great at accomplishing what they needed to in the law. And so what they are saying here is, Paul writes, and he says, be careful of the mutilators of the flesh, circumcision. That's what they practice, and they're saying, well, we need to still do these things. We know that Jesus Christ died. We know that he, he rose from the dead, but however, we need to add a little bit of religion to that. And Paul is fighting against this, and he's saying, beware of these because these are the ones that could lead you astray. And these were Judaizers in the day in the church of Philippi. And then he goes on in verse 4. He says, though I'm, I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he might have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And here it comes. The comparison is coming. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, Judaizers, listen to this. I am the Tiger Woods of golf. I've won the Oscars. I am the Manchester United of the Premier League. And here I am. I can do all these things. All these things. You, you might do it, but if you compare yourself to me, you don't stand a chance. You don't stand a chance because the flesh will benefit you absolutely nothing. And Paul writes this because it's important for us to understand that we need to live in the spirit rather than in the flesh. If we are going to uh, uh, um, get rid of the flesh, to crucify the flesh, we need to live in the spirit. And that's important. In Colossians, uh, I think it's 2 verse 3 verse 1 or 2 verse 1, it says, set your mind on things above and not things on the earth. Important, verse 5, important to understand, he says this in verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. The only way we can crucify the flesh is when we walk in the spirit and we set our minds on things above. I want to ask you this question. These Judaizers had a treasure chest that they believed in. They believed in things that they thought was going to be great. It's like me talking about my old trophies. You know, I've got a play of the tournament. I had great trophies at home, but they are trophies of the past. And what we tend to do is polish them. But actually today, it means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And this is what the Judaizers believed they could bring with them. They thought they could bring the old law with them and accompany that with the accomplished work of what Christ has already done on the cross. I can tell you now that it's not going to help. One of the great things I've learned in order to walk in the Spirit, firstly, is to study the Word of God, which is so important. It says this, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Yeah. Important to understand. You will not be able to fight any spiritual fight unless you dig deep in the Word of God. So what distractions and big things are holding you from walking in the Spirit? What distraction is it that you have that is deterring you from looking at, Christ, looking at Christ Jesus and in crucifying the flesh? I'd like to ask that question and think about that for a second. Number two, fight to have confidence in Christ. And I love this. Paul is now saying he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is the man. And when he says he's of the tribe of Benjamin, we need to understand what Paul is really trying to say. His name was Saul. And Saul, the king Saul, was actually from the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah. And so Paul is saying, hold on, do you know who I am and where I come from? A Pharisee of Pharisees uh, concerning the law, blameless. That was me. And so he's almost comparing to say, listen, if you're going to talk about anything, I am that Ferrari that you're driving down the road. I'm the one who holds the Oscar concerning all these things. And so let's read what Paul writes 
in verse 7, he says, but, and I like that because now he's breaking it. He's breaking, he's bringing something new to us. And he says, but, and I love it when there's a but involved. And that's important to understand. He says this, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Rubbish. Law, what you've achieved, what you've done in the flesh, rubbish, he says. I count it as lost. Come on, you have to think about what Jesus is worth. If Paul says, hey, listen, I've accomplished it, but I count it as rubbish. And he says this, and the Greek word for rubbish is skopidia, and I'll spell that out just in case. S-K-O-U-P-I-D-I-A, meaning trash, garbage, junk, litter, rubbish, swipe. And I don't know what swipe is, but it's in there. Um, that I may gain Christ, he says, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, there we go, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God, by faith. <laughs> I can tell you now, it's much easier than you think. It's much easier than the things that we want to conjure up. There's always this thing that we want to add in our life. Man, if I sit down and pray, I don't think God is going to hear me. Maybe I should stand. If I walk, I'll remember what to say. If I come into the church with a cap on my head, I don't know if God would like that. There are always things we are adding and God is saying, but hold on, just have faith in me and I'll look at your heart and know what's going on. We need to be convinced and convicted that Christ is enough. We need to be convinced and convicted that Christ is enough. This is the fight that we are in. This is what we are fighting against, the flesh. And secondly, we are fighting for to have confidence in Christ Jesus. When I say that, I mean we need to know that he is enough. And nothing needs to be added to what Christ has already done for us. It's like having a treasure chest when you have the law. When you walk to the treasure chest, you find it empty. You find it empty when you find Christ Jesus. What you do find is the pearl of great price. That's what you'll find in that treasure chest. His name is Jesus. Whatever great things we achieve through the desires of the flesh counts as nothing before God. I want to repeat that. Whatever great things we achieve through the desires of the flesh counts as nothing before God. When I was in Site 5 years ago, I started a soup kitchen in Site 5, went in there, all guns blazing, ready to serve the Lord and just make Jesus proud of me. You know, I wanted to go in and just help the people of Site 5. I went in with a, a very, very dedicated group at the time. And uh, we've been praying for a little boy who had cerebral palsy and he was on his knees and his elbows, couldn't speak. We had to feed him for a whole year as we went into Site 5. And then we started praying, praying, praying for a full year. At the end of that year, we saw this boy come running towards us. It's an absolute miracle because we persisted in serving in that area. And we saw the miracle. We saw the miracle of this boy coming running towards us. And it's a beautiful thing. Our first salvation, Tan Tandiwe, who worked here at, uh, at Julia Junction with my wife, Jen, is now serving. And, and it's a great thing that God shows us these things. However, something scared me a little bit as I went in. I thought, this is who I am and this is what I'm going to do. And I started making this about Wayne going into Site 5. And I read a scripture in Luke 13 saying this, Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Scary. Scary. Now, I'm not saying I wasn't saved. All I'm saying is that woke me up. Because this is Jesus who says he doesn't know you. It's not me saying I don't know Jesus. But what I'm trying to get to is the importance that we understand that Jesus is more interested in a relationship with him rather than what we do for him. It was a scary thing. I was out there doing things, but my relationship with Jesus was lacking. Therefore, having no confidence in Christ because of my relationship lacking with him, I tried to do things to please him. Don't fall into that trap. Fight against that and fight to have confidence in Christ Jesus alone. Colossians 3, 2 to 4 says this, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Find yourself in Christ Jesus. Develop a strong relationship with him through the word of God. Whatever happens, fight to have confidence in Christ Jesus. Here's a question for you. What have you achieved that is so great that it is keeping you from pursuing Christ with all you have? Can I repeat that? What have you achieved that is so great that is now keeping you from pursuing Christ with all you have? We have those things in our lives. Busyness creeps in, and the things that we pursue always keeps us from pursuing Christ Jesus and having a relationship with him. Have confidence in Christ. And number three, fight and challenge complacency. Just a reminder that Paul is still writing from the prison, and like I said, he's actually fighting for something. He is fighting against something, and he's fighting for something. What he's fighting against is the law, the flesh of what people found they would, might, might have comforted in, comfort in. And then what he's fighting for is for us to understand and know Christ Jesus. So here, number three, we say fight and challenge complacency. Not that I have already attained, and this is verse 12, where he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Uh, I remember um, playing a football match, and uh, it, it was a tough game. It was our, our arch enemies and uh, uh, old mutual at the time, and we, half time, it, we were 3 0 up. We were so pumped in this football match, and uh, half time we thought, well, this game is easier than we thought. You know, enemies, they lying second, we lying first, and there's this battle of the top two, and we thought it was going to be much tougher. And uh, half time, 3 0 up and cruising. So we go back onto the field, obviously now being bossy and looking good, 3 0 up, and we decide we're going to just relax. You know, when you want to maintain something, you want to keep something at a 3 0, you're just going to try and maintain the team, play the ball around. And we took our foot off the pedal. Instead of attacking more and instead of scoring more goals, we tried to keep them at bay. And before we knew it, it was 3 1. Then suddenly, we, as we just we started waking up and said, hey, guys, it's 3-1. We made a mistake. 3-2. Like, what's happening here? 3-2. And now we're making mistakes at the back. We're panicking. I mean, things are going wrong. And suddenly they get a penalty. 3-0. And there's five minutes left to play. And now we're fighting to win this game again. But also, they're coming at us because now their confidence is boosted. And it's 3-0. It's and we're always trying to fight. Now we're trying to get to the goalpost, their goalpost, in trying to score the winner. It didn't work. And we drew three all. Why do I tell that story? Some, when Paul writes this and he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. And I just want to stop there. You see, Paul, he's got trophies in his hand. He's planted churches. He can talk about the things that he's done. He can talk about, the, if anyone, he's the one that could speak about the church in Philippi, in Ephesus, Colossae. He's the one that can speak about that and sit in jail and says, oh, look, Lord, I've done it all. <laughs> no, not Paul. He says, I press on. You see, the, the analogy of the football match is the fact that we thought we were okay, so we started idling. And that's the thing in our spiritual walk with Christ. We are saved. We are okay. We've done two things great, and we put it down on our resume for Christ Jesus, and then we start idling. Because we've done it all. That's what happens when the enemy says, yes, you can relax, but everything else around you becomes turmoil. Remember what I said, we are not fighting symptoms here. We are fighting the cause. And the cause is where our heart lies, that we continue to pursue Christ and continue to fight. As Paul says, I, I press on. The fact that Paul is saved, the fact that Paul has created different churches, started different churches, he still presses on. It's a beautiful thing. And so I say the third point that I want to tell us is fight against the, uh, and fight and challenge complacency. We can become complacent in our walk with Christ Jesus. Uh, Gabe earlier mentioned how his soul yearns. His, his soul is yearning uh, uh, for, for Christ Jesus. His soul is yearning for God. We should be yearning to have God in our life. We should be yearning for his presence. We should be yearning to be in relationship with him. 
But what we do sometimes is we take our foot off the pedal, we relax, we idle, and the enemy creeps up. The enemy is coming for you, and you're sitting there, and before you know it, you're trying to fight a battle. And then you say, well, perhaps it is what it is. That's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to fight and continue to press on and fight complacency. And that was what the Bible calls us to do, is to fight complacency, never to become complacent in our walk with Christ Jesus. Whatever happens, I really want to say this, whatever happens, crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. Have confidence in Christ Jesus and fight against complacency. God has called us to far greater things than you think so, ma'am. And these are the causes we are fighting. These are not symptoms. I'm not saying fight for a job. I'm not saying fight for your marriage. I'm not saying, what I'm saying here is that we need to fight the cause of why we end up where we end up. And that's because we need to fight for a relationship with Christ Jesus. We need to get off our seats and stop complacency in its tracks. And we need to crucify the flesh. And that's what God has called us to do. And I want to say this evening that our Savior Jesus Christ, our Savior Jesus Christ crucified his flesh so that we can live, so that we can have eternal life. He had a confidence in his kingdom. See, God, Jesus never came down and doubted what he's bringing. He knew what he was bringing, the kingdom of God to earth. He had a confidence in his kingdom. And thirdly, he was never complacent, even to that walk to the cross. Never became complacent because of you and me for what it was worth. He did it for us. Uh, Our God, our Savior, never became complacent for us. He kept on fighting. And let me tell you, today, he's still fighting for us. He is still fighting for us, never complacent. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, still fighting for us. And I'm trusting this evening that you receive that word, that we go deep. We go deep. We don't fight the symptoms. We go deep. Whatever happens, keep on fighting. But fight the true fight. Fight the true fight. Fight the one that is deep down inside of you, not the one that displays itself on the outside. But fight what is truly in your heart and allow yourself to develop an amazing relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I pray for us? Father in heaven, you are absolutely incredible. What a privilege this evening as we look towards you, as we we take up the fight, not against flesh and blood, but we know that it's against powers and principalities. And Lord, we know that you are the one who has defeated the enemy. And we thank you that we can find ourselves in you We can find ourselves in you and be victorious in you. What a gift. What a gift, Lord. What a gift. So we thank you this evening. We exalt you this evening. We give you praise. Bless those who are listening to this message. And I trust, Lord, whoever's there that is hearing this message for the first time, who's wondering who this Jesus is, I pray, God, that they'll press in, lift their hand, Come to church, give their life to the Lord, and say, here I am. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness towards your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.